Gracious Lord, thank you for the opportunity we've had already to be able to exalt the name of the Lord Jesus, and his name is holy, his, high, his name is high and lifted up, and we are grateful for the opportunity to be together, a company of your people, in order to give you the place that is your due. And now as we turn to your word, it is our prayer that you will grant us, please, the gift of the Holy Spirit to lead and to guide in Jesus' strong name. Uh, I've been asked what books I'm reading uh, on Song of Songs, and the three that I've been using are these. I'm not going to give them away. Uh, Song of Songs, a biblical, theological, allegorical, Christological interpretation by James Hamilton, published by Christian Focus. That's been very helpful uh, on essentially what the text is saying. The second book that I've been using is Five Festal Garments by Barry Webb. Uh, published by Apollos, and this has been use useful to see how Song of Songs fits into the whole uh, uh, sweep of Bible truth. And the third book that I've been using uh, is Eugene Peterson's Five uh, Smooth Stones for Pastoral Work, published by William Erdsman. And like Bar Barry Webb, he uh, views Song of Songs within the context of other Old Testament books, particularly Ruth and Lamentations, Ecclesiastes and Esther, and I will quote uh, from Peterson a wee bit later on. Well, last uh, week, Drew very helpfully introduced us to this song like no other, a composition that is quite literally the song of songs. And uh, just as we uh, pick up our ears and pay extra attention, when we mention something like King of Kings or Lord of Lords. So now we pay uh, a special note when we turn to what the Bible calls the song that is like no other. And uh, we saw last week that it is first and foremost a, a love song, uh, a song with a number of participants, but essentially uh, a musical composition between a woman and a man, a female, and a male, a bride, and a groom. It's a song of infatuation, vulnerability, and a celebration of sexual love within the magnificent and appropriate boundaries of marriage. For as it says, not once but three times, do not arouse or waken love until it uh, so ple pleases. And you see that in chapter 2, verse 7, chapter 3, verse 5, and chapter 8, verse 4. And Song of Songs, by the way, is found bang in the middle of our Bibles. Uh, we'll be looking at page 680, uh, following uh, in just a couple of moments. So we're reminded not once, but three times, not to arouse or waken love until the right moment. Not because the song has reservations about the goodness of falling in love and sexual intimacy uh, within its uh, uh, proper context, the breathtaking intensity of a lifelong committed relationship between one man and one woman, but because uh, it recognizes that in chapter 2, verse 15, we have that little intriguing reference to little foxes. Um, the little foxes can easily damage the fragile blossoms of the vineyard, and that can have serious long-term consequences for its fruitfulness. And so the song reminds us that the farmer who invests in his or her energy protecting the integrity of the vineyard will not regret it later, even though the benefits of this painful perseverance will not be obvious until the time is fully ripe. And then you remember Drew very helpfully encouraged us to think of some very practical steps each one of us can take in order to cultivate uh, necessary self-control, whether it is concerning our television watching, our internet browsing, our leisure time locations, or the company we keep. Now, I'm conscious that some people here enjoy poetry, and uh, poetry is perfectly plain to you what is being talked about. Uh, so when uh, things like spice or honeycomb or pomegranates and fountains are mentioned, 
Uh, for you, that is immediately clear what the poet is talking about. And so, in order to explain or dissect the text would be an act of barbarism, because the power and the beauty of the message is tied up with the rhythm and the language and the colorful imagery of the text. But for others, I suspect this poem, like much poetry, is like a foreign language, almost impossible to interpret without help. And so the task that I've got tonight is the delicate one of explaining without ruining, uh, talking plain language without at the same time reducing this song above all songs to just another plain text. And so with that in mind, shall we turn to our Bible reading for tonight, which is chapter 3, verse 6, to chapter 5, verse 1. And as I say, that's page 680. Uh, we're simply going to pick up this evening where we left off last Sunday. So chapter, chapter 3 and verse 6, and uh, it starts with a question. Who is this coming up from the desert like a column of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, made from all the spices of the merchant? Look, it is Solomon's carriage, escorted by 60 warriors, the noblest of Israel, all of them wearing the sword, all experienced in battle, each with his sword at his side, prepared for the terrors of the night. King Solomon made for himself the carriage. He made it of wood from Lebanon. Its posts he made of silver, its base of gold. Its seat was upholstered with purple, its interior lovingly inlaid by the daughters of Jerusalem. Come out, you daughters of Zion. And look at King Solomon wearing the crown, the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, the day his heart rejoiced. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes behind your veil are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep just shorn, coming down from the washing. Each has its twin. Not one of them is alone. Your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built with elegance. On it hangs a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. Your two breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies until the day breaks and the shadows flee. I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of incense. All beautiful you are, my darling. There is no flaw in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon. Descend from the crest of Amana, from the top of Senir, the summit of Hermon, from the lion's dens and the mountain haunts of the leopards. You have stolen my heart, my sister, my bride. You have stolen my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How delightful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much more pleasing is your love than wine and the fragrance of your perfume than any spice. Your lips drop sweetness as the honeycomb, my bride. Milk and honey are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like that of Lebanon. You are a garden locked up, my sister, my bride. You are a spring enclosed, a sealed fountain. 
Your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with choice fruits, with henna and nard, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with every kind of incense tree, with myrrh and aloes, with all the finest spices. You are a garden fountain a well of flowing water streaming down from Lebanon. Awake, north wind, and come, south wind. Blow on my garden, that its fragrance may spread abroad. Let my lover come into his garden and taste its choicest fruits. I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. Eat, O oh friends, and drink. Drink your fill, O oh lover. Okay, so what are we to say? Well, let's take this as it comes, and I've got three points that I'd like us to consider this evening, and they are these. Sexuality is like paradise in Genesis. Secondly, sexuality is like the exodus and thirdly and lastly, sexuality is like the book of Revelation. Now, hopefully, this will become clear as we proceed. But first of all, then, sexuality is like paradise. Well, we've been reading chapter 4, verse 1. How beautiful you are, my darling, oh, how beautiful. Uh, and Peterson says, your dove-like eyes are veiled by your hair as it shimmers and flows. Isn't that good? Like a flock of goats in the distance, streaming down a hillside in the sunshine. Your smile is generous and full, expressive and strong and clean. Your lips are jewel-like, your mouth elegant and inviting, your veiled cheeks soft and radiant. Now, I don't know if this young lady really was Miss World, or if she was like Miss World to the groom. After all, in chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, you can see the girl has articulated her own bodily insecurities. And everybody, and I mean everybody, has those. But the point is this, that love is blind. And when two people are infatuated with each other, faults are ignored. And embarrassment with the shape of your nose or the color of your hair becomes totally and utterly irrelevant. And I think that's what Genesis 2.25 means when it says the man and the wife were both naked and felt no shame. Now, ordinarily, when two people are naked, they react in one of two ways. Either they are, are, are embarrassed or else they are brazen. Sometimes uh, a young person will say, or older people uh, as well, will say, oh, I could never get married because I could never expose my body to somebody else. But that, you see, is to forget what First John says, that perfect love casts out fear. And in a marriage of generosity and a marriage of gentleness, kind words and respect and consideration overcome all sense of embarrassment. The alternative, sadly, is what happens when two or more people have no consideration for boundaries and constraints and care nothing about what chapter 4, verse 12 describes as a garden locked up. And that way, 
is the way of brazenness and licentiousness, licentiousness and pornography. The Bible way, the third way, however, is neither prudish nor lustful. It's neither embarrassed by intimacy nor is it brazen about sex. God's way is the way of paradise. In other words, it's a reflection of the Garden of Eden, a place of orchards. Do you see that in verse 13? And pomegranates of choice fruits, every kind of incense, all the finest spices. And at the right moment, at the right time, chapter 4, verse 10, the bride voluntarily unlocks her garden. The groom enters, and together they enjoy not the forbidden fruit of Eden, but the choicest gifts that God has prepared for them as husband and wife. So God does not put boundaries on marital relations to limit enjoyment, but in order to maximize it. Now, some have speculated when it was that Solomon, if Solomon is the author of this song and not just a pseudonym for somebody else, uh, when might Solomon have written this love poem? Was it before he had his 700 wives and 300 concubines? Uh, a time uh, of hope and of innocence, looking forward to a life in intimacy and faithfulness? Was it late looking back with sorrow and regret at the complicated mess of his family context? Whatever way, it's a reminder that if we aspire to marrying a virgin, and that is a good thing, it is only right and reasonable that we present our vineyard to our spouse in full bloom, as it were so that both can enjoy its fruit without regret or remorse. The intensity of the waiting, Ian Dugat of Westminster Theological Seminary says, the intensity of the waiting makes the final consummation all the more glorious. Failure should lead not simply to guilt but to repentance. While God enabled purity should not result in pride, but profound thankfulness to God for his grace that protected us against ourselves. So that's the first point. Uh, sexuality is like paradise. Okay, you still with me? Is all this making sense without ruining its romance, its poetry? I hope so. But secondly, if sexuality is presented here in this song above all songs, like the Garden of Eden in the book of Genesis, sexuality is also portrayed here like the events as revealed in the book of Exodus. Just when you thought we had exhausted that book, what do we find here in chapter 3, verse 6 to 11? But imagery of sexuality like an exodus experience. Who is this coming up from the desert? Like a column of smoke. Even as Israel, God's firstborn son, protected by God through Sinai, through the desert, en route to paradise restored, the promised land. So now Solomon, this king-like figure, this noble groom is portrayed here like the children of Israel making their way through the desert to the land. Do you see that? Uh, chapter 4, verse 11, to the land flowing with milk and honey. And just as the Hebrews were accompanied by a pillar of cloud, so this eager nobleman is enveloped, not enveloped, enveloped with a column of smoke and borne aloft in a covered tent-like box made of wood from Lebanon 
carried on poles that rest on shoulders. Does that image remind you of anything else from the Exodus story? And more, do you remember how myrrh and frankincense was such a significant part of worship uh, around the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle? These are spices associated with a king, yes? Well, look, verse 6, and see how this coming king is heralded. In fact, you can smell him before you can see him. He's an old spice man. And here in this song of all songs, we see how all five of the senses are employed. Um, here's just an, 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 a sample. Taste, chapter 4, verse 11, yes. Sight, chapter 4, verse 1. Touch, chapter 2, verse 6. Smell, chapter 4, verse 16. And sound, uh, chapter 4, verse 15. So this encounter between bride and his groom is literally a sensuous experience. Every single part of the way God has made this king and his princess are evident in this song above all other songs because sexuality is portrayed here as something from Exodus, a departure from the past, an entry into the present, a leaving of the old and a cleaving to the new, an exodus from the place of sadness and longing and a journey and a celebration to the place of promise of a land flowing with milk and honey. So here in Song of Songs, sexuality is like paradise, as evident in the book of Genesis, the Garden of Eden. And here in Song of Songs, sexuality is compared to the exodus from Egypt and entry into the promised land. This is heady stuff, isn't it? No wonder love must be uh, not aroused or awakened before it's a lot of time because sexuality has a power that is both intoxicating and overpowering. But how wonderful when it is enjoyed as intended by God to be within the security of the beauty and gentle parameters of marriage, a lifelong um, relationship for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish as long as we both shall live. But just before we conclude, there is one more thing that must be said. And it is this. Because what is written here in Song of Songs is not all that has to be said about sexu sexuality because uh, we are not simply uh, looking at Genesis and Exodus, but we are pointed towards the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Well, what do I mean? Well, you see, for some of us, this book uh, causes the pulse to quicken, and for others, it makes the heart to sink. Because for you, whether as a single person or a widow, as somebody who is divorced or same-sex attracted, what Solomon and the Shulamite uh, are celebrating here may never be your experience. And what we are talking about here in this book with such delight may not be within your grasp. What then? Indeed, for some discipleship will mean being willing to forgo marriage and home and loved ones, even life itself for the sake of the kingdom. And that's why God's word, of which Song of Songs is one part, points us beyond itself, beyond the book of Genesis, beyond Exodus, and urges us to look forward to the final book of the Bible, for ultimate fulfillment and consummation. Yes, we have been made as physical beings. 
Yes, God has created us with senses to be utilized, to be enjoyed. But Jesus shows us that while our physical bodies are important, after all, he was the word made flesh. He did not shun our human condition. Yet, as C.S. Lewis famously said in Mere Christianity, if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. And that's what the book of Revelation does for us, because in it, funny enough, we read about a bride and her lover, about a king and his princess, about Christ and his church. Glance over, if you will, to the very last two chapters of the book of Revelation. That's Revelation 21 and 22. Just as recently as Friday, uh, somebody asked me in a pastoral visit about something that President Bush had said at his father's funeral. You may have heard it where he talked about his father now being able to uh, uh, cuddle uh, his infant daughter who had died and his wife Barbara in heaven and uh, in this conversation we talked about Jesus words in Matthew 22 and Luke 20 where Jesus says there will be no uh, marriage in heaven as we know it now but neither will there be any singleness because in God's immediate presence both will have been replaced by a greater reality. The final union between Christ and his people in which all of the redeemed will be included. In chapter 19, verse 7, we have this written. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, given her to wear. And the Bible, like the Song of Songs, ends with a bride calling for the one who loves her to come. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, Revelation 22, verse 17. And so the love depicted in this song in Revelation is not only a taste of what was given in creation, but a sign of what will be consummated in the new creation. And that is a sign of the gospel. Now again, this kind of language may make you feel a little uncomfortable. After all, does it not feel right to equate sexual intimacy with the love that Christ has for his church? But this is where we need to realize that God's love is absolutely pure. It is holy holy. And this is, of course, one of the greatest mysteries of the universe. Christ's intense, incredible, powerful, death-defying, fiercely jealous love for the church, so deep he was prepared to die for her. And we as God's people, by grace, are privileged to be part of that. There is a deeper intimacy that can be known in heaven that can never be experienced in this world married or unmarried in all its complexity and need there's just one observation I'd like to end on if I may because in my mind it's something that is staggering and worth sharing. Do you know the way in our culture that the climax of a story is nearly all at the end, whether it's a book or a novel or a play, while in Hebrew culture, the most important point that anybody wants to say is located bang in the middle of the text. And you'll remember that we've observed that uh, before. 
Well, guess what is located in the center of the Song of Songs? Any idea what's at the very core? And the answer is chapter 4, verse 16. It's the garden. Let my lover come into his garden and taste his choicest fruits. I have come into my garden, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh and my spice. 111 lines before that verse, 111 lines after. The physical consummation of bride and groom is the climax of this song. Bang in the middle of the book. Now how does the whole Bible end? For non-Hebrew minds, how does God conclude his word? And the answer, wonderfully enough, Revelation 22 is where the king and his bride, the church, are perfectly united. And the invitation is given in chapter 22, verse 17, to all who will hear, come. Whoever is thirsty, come. Come and share in this perfect fulfillment that is to be found in union with Christ. Come. Whoever wishes, come, freely take the gift of the fountain of life. Stunning. Let's pray. Father God, your word astonishes us. Thank you for its tenderness, loveliness, and power. And as we go from here this evening, encouraged and inspired and thrilled by your beauty, enable us, please, to live in the light of your purity, your love, and your grace to live faithful and good and generous lives. And what we ask is for the sake of Christ, who is altogether lovely.